instructor, supplemental instructor for this class. Uh, so I'll be attending every class with you and relearning re all the material. Uh, I took this class my uh, freshman year, first semester, and I got an A in it. So now they want me to help you succeed because this is, this class considered like one of the difficult classes that like a lot of people fail, not to scare you or anything, <laughs> but that's why I'm here. Uh, I will be holding uh, three sessions every week. Uh, sometime at night, like 6, 7 p.m. The times and days are yet to be determined, uh, but I'll let you know when. And uh, yes, so uh, we will be just like re reviewing material and practicing some extra problems, uh, uh, having some extra sessions before exams, uh, just like a little practice meetings. You can think about it as building study time. Maybe some of, some of you already attended the SI session, so you know what it is. But I highly recommend attending, it's very useful. I'll also be attending every class with you. I'll be over here. So if you have any questions before or after class, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you. All right, does anyone have any questions for our SI instructor, uh, Daria? Okay, I tried to start the recording kind of in the middle of that. So for anybody who's watching the recording, okay, our SI just introduced herself. Her name is Daria, and she'll be holding sessions remotely, right? So uh, no, it's actually gonna in, be person. in person. Okay, yeah. in person. And do you know the room? No. Okay, room. Don't tell me at the end of this week. So okay. I'll send you an email. Room, location, time, TBD, three times a week. I highly recommend that you go. Um, it's probably, it's right up there with office hours in terms of best bang for your buck in terms of time spent for learning achieved. Okay, so, you know, studying on your own, I kind of discussed last time, is not always the most, is not always the easiest way to learn uh, just because it's hard for you to identify your own weaknesses and then shore those up. But if you're working with someone who can see your level of understanding, meet you where you are, and help you shore up some of the gaps that you don't even know that you have, that is gonna be a lot more useful in terms of time spent. Okay, anything else from the SI? I'm good. Okay, fantastic, we're all good. All right, so I guess we'll start for today. So I guess this semester I'm gonna try to start each class by putting this screen up on the board of stuff that we're going to do today and also the things that you should be keeping track of in terms of homework uh, and that sort of thing. And I'll try to post like whatever homework can be accomplished after today's class. Like today we're going to finish up 1.1 and 1.2. We're probably going to start 1.3 if we have time. Uh, but these are the questions that you'll be able to do on the homework after today's class. I mean you might be able to do some of the other ones if you just, you know, this kind of first chapter is mostly review, um, but yeah, so that's the homework. Uh, the readiness test, okay, remember this is on Blackboard, you go to course content, there's instructions on there. Just read the instructions carefully and follow them uh, to take the readiness test for the class. Has anybody done it already? Brendan did it already, Emma, okay. So a few people, remember that it is taken for a grade of one completion point. Okay, so it's not going to make or break your grade, uh, but we'd like you to complete it. Um, it'll help give us some good statistics on where our students are at, and it'll help you get an idea of where you are in terms of whether you have all of the review skills mastered in order to be successful in the class. Okay, so the number that got thrown at us by our overlords was if you get a 70%, then you're probably well prepared to succeed in the class. Okay, it doesn't mean if you don't get a 70%, then you're gonna fail. It certainly doesn't mean that, especially since on web work, there's all sorts of bugs and issues with students entering things slightly incorrectly and getting things wrong, so. Uh, but if you do score comparatively poorly, then you might want to come and chat with me during office hours. I have office hours today from 3 to 4.30 on Microsoft Teams. Okay, so the way you get there is you go to Blackboard, you go to course content, and you click on the Microsoft Teams link, and then I'll get a little thing that uh, will 
ask me if I allow you to join and then I allow you to join and I'll be in there and you can come talk with me um, that way. Okay, any questions about readiness test, homework, office hours? Or anything else? Okay, uh, then what I'm gonna do for today is I'm gonna finish up what we were talking about last time, this kind of detour that I was on, and then we're gonna form our groups. We're gonna do a little bit of uh, group work here and there, and a little bit of talking from me, and um, yeah, that'll be what we do today. Okay, so I think last time, I was sort of introducing this analogy for functions, which I find is oftentimes really useful for students. And it's to think about a function as being like a machine, okay? So this is like if you've ever been to the airport, right? You've got your luggage, goes in the machine, and it takes the x-ray, and then it comes out, right? This is the kind of picture that we should have in mind. So. What does the machine do? Well, it has a certain rule which it applies, okay? Some numbers can go into the machine, something happens, and then some potentially different number comes out the other side. It might be the same number, or it might be a different number. We don't know. But the idea is that it should be consistent. Any machine that we want to have in our factories or whatever, we should be able to know that our machines are going to do a replicable task, i.e. if I feed it the number 2 and the number 4 comes out, if I feed it another 2 later on, I should expect again for a number 4 to come out, okay? So this is what I was talking about with uh, the idea of for each input there's a definite output, right? So it should be the same each time. Any questions on that? Okay, we'll come back every now and again to this uh, analogy throughout the course. All right, but uh, one kind of nice thing to think about in terms of this analogy is the domain and range of a function. So we already, I think, kind of discussed the domain, didn't we? Let's see, maybe I should... Okay, I'll copy this. I'll copy this down. The domain of a function is the set of all input numbers, right? Okay, let me maybe qualify that a little bit more. Set of all input numbers such that the function is defined. Okay, so what do I mean by that? What I mean is I have certain numbers which I can plug in to the left side of our machine. Right? But depending on what our machine does, there might be some numbers which, if I were to try to plug them in, the machine is just going to blow up. Nothing's going to happen. Okay? It's going to break our machine. Okay? So that would be a number that's not in the domain. Okay? Because it would be a number which is an input, but this second qualification is not satisfied, such that the function is defined. Okay? So let's see a really quick example of that. We could have a function like f of x equals 1 over x. Let's try to write down what the domain of this function is. Now, remember, a domain is a set. Okay, So I'm going to write this set using set notation. Okay, And I just want to think about, well, what are all the numbers which I could plug into this function such that the resulting number is defined? Okay, does anybody immediately see one number which we should exclude from the domain? Zero. Yeah, okay, everybody says zero. Why zero? Because we can't divide by zero, right? Doesn't make any sense. Okay, so uh, we should definitely exclude zero. Any other numbers that are going to cause a problem for this? Okay, uh, let me maybe give a caveat that we're not really going to talk or consider imaginary numbers in this class. Um, 
well, are we? No, I don't think we are. We're, yeah, we're not gonna consider imaginary numbers in this class. So for now, let's just work over a subset of the real numbers, okay? So all of our domain will just be all real numbers except for the ones which make this function blow up. So we won't consider imaginary numbers. Any other numbers that are gonna cause a problem? Yeah, but that would be sort of presuming that the function already had some sort of radical in it. We'll get to an example like that in a minute, right? But for now, we're just considering numbers which already exist, okay? So I don't think that there's anything else that's going to cause a problem. So now what I want to do is write down a set which contains all of the numbers in the real numbers except for the number 0. Okay, I can write that down in a few ways. Okay, I'll write down a couple of ways. The first way would just to be able to say, okay, x is not equal to zero. That's our only condition. Okay, and maybe you would also say x is an R. Okay, so x is a real number and it's not zero. That's one way of putting it. Another way of putting it would be to use interval notation. So x is in the intervals negative infinity, we use a parenthesis on negative infinity, up to zero, and I'm going to put a parenthesis because I don't include it. And then a union, zero, comma, infinity. That's a way we could write it down. Okay, so this first set is a bucket which contains all the numbers between negative infinity and zero, not including zero. Right? And then I, I use some Velcro, and I attach it to another set which contains all the numbers which are larger than zero. Okay, but the one number that's not in here is zero, because it's excluded from both of those sets. Okay, so that's some interval notation. Or we could say x is uh, less than zero or x larger than zero. Okay, which really these two things are like a translation of one another, right? It's just a different language, right? It's just a different language. X is less than zero or X is larger than zero. You can think of this union as meaning or, right? And then this set here is the numbers which are less than zero and this sets the numbers which are larger than zero. Okay, so three different ways of writing down a set, okay, which a domain is a set of numbers. All right, we happy so far? OK, so that's one thing we got to worry about is dividing by 0. OK, and the second thing we got to worry about is going to come up in this equation. What do we think for the domain of this function? Uh, well, what do we think of the domain of this function under the assumption that we are not working with imaginary numbers in this course? What should we exclude here? Yeah? Yeah. We want whatever we take the square root of to be a positive number. Okay? At least as long as we're considering this as a function. Okay, if you take more math classes later on, maybe you'll learn something more complicated here. But in this case, what we want is for x minus 2 to be larger than or equal to 0. Right? So if we just solve this inequality, we just get that x should be larger than or equal to 2. Okay? Okay? Or you could say, uh, you know, x is in the interval from 2 to infinity. Okay? Or something like that. Okay, so what are the two things we want to worry about? The two things we want to worry about is no dividing by zero and no square roots of negative numbers. Okay, those are the two things to look out for when we're doing the domain of a function. Okay, and I also wrote down this thing on the right hand side. So sometimes the domain is going to be given in the problem. Okay, what I mean by that is you'll, it'll say f of x equals x for x larger than 0, something like that, OK? If the problem gives you the domain, then that's the domain of the function. But if it's not given, 
and say we are asked to find the domain, then our domain is going to be all real numbers such that the function is defined. OK, so we just take this big class of numbers, all of the real ones, and we throw out anything that makes our function blow up. OK? Are you happy? Am I going too slow here? How's the pace? Fine. OK, let's move on to range. OK, so what is the range of a function? Well, the range of a function is the set of uh, resulting outputs from applying function to a number in the domain. OK, so figuring out the range of a function can be a little bit trickier in terms of you got to use a little bit of, uh, I don't know, deductive reasoning when you're finding the range of a function. OK, because here's what we can't do. We can't just go ahead and plug in every single number in the domain, right? Why can't we do that? Why can't I take a function and just plug in every number? Yeah? Because not all of the values in the range have a domain with them. Well, all of, any number which is in the domain will have an associated number, which is, I mean, sorry, any number which is in the range will have an associated input from the domain. That's true. But? <laughs> That, that's another thing to consider, OK? So you might say, well, why don't we just invert this function and then find the domain? That would tell us the range. Well, not exactly, because there might be multiple inputs which go to the same output. right? But I'm getting at something a little bit simpler than this. I can't just plug in every single number from the domain and figure out what that number is under the function, because there's maybe infinitely many numbers in the domain. So I can't just plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, on and on forever and figure out what I get. Right? So I have to think a little bit more clearly. In this case, I'm going to use the graph of this function. Okay? So if I take f of x equals x squared, then I know that this is graphed as a parabola. right? And I know that the y values of this function are the range. Right? The range is the set of y values, or outputs. So this function's domain is all real numbers, but its range is what? Based on this graph. What do we think? Zero to infinity. Yeah, 0 to infinity, including or excluding 0. Including, right? We just want to think about, well, is there a number which I can plug in for x such that I actually get 0? And the answer is yes. You plug in 0 for x, and then you get 0 squared, which is 0. OK, so we include 0. OK. So what is the graph of a function? We're, we're like nearly done with this thing. The graph of a function is? the set of all points x comma f of x such that x is in the domain. OK, so for this example, we get you know, 1 comma 1, 2 comma 4, 3 comma 9, OK, all of those points. We put them all into a set, right? So for, for f of x equals x squared, the graph of the function is going to be all points x comma f of x, x comma x squared, such that x is a real number. Okay. So the points which are in this bucket, so now my bucket isn't just holding numbers. My bucket is holding ordered pairs. And I put in each ordered pair, 
that satisfies the property that the second number is the square of the first number. All right, so this is an example of a set which isn't a set of numbers, it's a set of ordered pairs. So sets can be just collections of items. Okay, but that's getting a little bit abstract. Any questions on the graph of a function? Yeah. Not so much the graph, but um, when you write x uh, dot t dot, um, what does that stand for? Such that. Okay. Yeah, this means such that. Sorry, I will use that a lot. Such that. <coughs> Good question. Any other questions? OK. Then I think we can move on. I'm not going to do this example. I already did one. So I just want to remind everyone okay, about the one rule about functions to rule them all. Okay. So what we need to remember about functions is one input absolutely cannot map to more than one output. Okay? If that happens, it's not a function. Okay? So for example, if they tell us that f of 1 is equal to 2, and they tell us that f of 1 is equal to 4, well, our function doesn't make any sense. right? It should be consistent. So. That's the one rule about functions that can never be violated. Okay, now the follow-up question to that would be, how do you, what's the ways that you can test whether this rule is being violated or not? Okay, and that brings us to one test which we can do using the graph of a function. Okay, the vertical line test. You've probably done this at some point in your math career. So, the vertical line test, what we do is we look at the graph of the function, okay, here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our pencil, we're going to lay it flat on our paper, and we're going to move it left and right, vertically, right? And we're going to check and see, are there any spots on the graph where the function actually touches our pencil in more than one point? And for this graph, the answer is no. But if you think about a graph which looked more like if this thing wrapped around like that, okay, then we'd be in trouble, right? Because we'd put our pencil, we'd go, okay, one point, one point, one point, one point, oh crap, suddenly my pencil's intersecting the graph at more than one point. So that's a situation where this is no longer a function. Okay, because we have, we have one x value, which is here, and then we have two x, two y values. We got x comma y1, and then we also have this other point up here, x comma y2. So that's a situation where the one rule about functions to rule them all is being violated. Okay? So that's the vertical line test. The other way we do check this is when we have a, like a, a thing like this, where they show us all the inputs, and then they show us all the outputs, we just check for repeated values in, in the output. Uh, sorry, we check for repeated values in the input, right? If we see like 0 here going to 5 and then also 0 going to 3, then we'd be in trouble, right? So look for repeated values in the inputs. OK. Uh, man, this detour is longer than I thought it was going to be. Any questions about the vertical line test? I know I'm going through all of this really fast, but theoretically it should be review. What I want you to do is if you have questions on any of this stuff, just please write it down, make a note, come to office hours, talk to me after class or something, okay? All right, last thing before I get off my soapbox. The anatomy of a function. Okay, so this is just the way that we write it. Okay, so when I write this, the way you read it is y equals f of x, okay? y equals f of x, okay? That's the way I read it out loud. And we have a couple variables, okay? We have y and x, right? Those are our variables, and f is a function. So f is our function, and the way we can tell which one is the dependent variable versus the independent variable is by using this trick, okay? The input of the function is going to be the independent variable, 
and that variable is going to be inside the parentheses. Okay? That's the way that I like to remember it. Wait, so the independent is inside the parentheses? Exactly. Independent variable goes inside the parentheses. It's like in and in, right? All right, that's the last thing. Everybody ready to move on? Does anybody like a little more time to copy down? Okay, generally I'll, I'll try to write everything most of the time so that I don't uh, go too fast over this stuff, but this is an exception. Okay, so let's see. I wanna move on to problem four here. Okay, we're going to skip problem three. I think we can get it from there. All right, so this is just a, a quick example of how to read function values from tables, okay? So what do we do? We just recognize that this is our input, okay? So these are our domain, and this is our range, okay? So if I want to know what f of 2 is, well, 2 is an input, which means it comes from the domain. So I look for the spot where I see 2 in the domain, Okay, so this 2, I look for the spot where I see a 2 in the domain, and then I look at the corresponding output. Okay, so you can imagine this 2 going in for x right here in the f of x, and then this tells us what it's going to be equal to. In this case, it's 6, right? Okay, and then we want to find the value for which f takes the value 5. Well, we look for 5 in the range, and it, we see that we get a 5 if we plug in 0. So that's way we can get that one, and so on and so forth. So let me ask you all, what do we think about this relation right here? Do we think that this is going to constitute a function based on our one rule about functions to rule them all? Okay, I'm seeing some heads nodding. Here's what we have to check. We need to check, are there repeated inputs in the domain? which go to different outputs. Okay, that's what I need to check. In this case, my inputs are 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8. All of those are different numbers. Okay, so I don't actually have any of the same number going to different values. It would be different if, say, we change this 4 to a 0. Then we would have 0 going to 5 and 0 going to 3, which would be a problem for our rule. But in this case, it's not zero. There's no repeated inputs. We're OK. So it is a function. OK, any questions about that? All right. OK, and then lastly, we can also use the graph of a function right, to figure out what the values are, OK, just by looking. I know that the values of the function, yeah? So your reasoning of why it was a function solely was because no inputs had double matched output? Essentially, yes. Okay. It's okay for numbers in the range to repeat, okay? But what we want to avoid is this situation, right? This situation happens when we have one input going to multiple outputs. So the way we would see that is the one input would be the zero here and a zero here, right? And then the multiple outputs would be the two heights, five and three, respectively. Okay, okay. so if it had been flipped on a graph, how would that have looked if your input was, let's say, two and six, and they both ended up giving you 10? Just hypothetically. Ah, so yeah, so the way that would look. So repeated outputs is the question, yes, right? Pretty much. So what if, we have, what if we have repeated outputs? So if we had a situation like this, 1, 2, 10, 10. I think this is what you're asking, right? Yeah, yes. What if we had this? What would that look like? Well, we'd have a graph which looked something like this. At x equals 1, the height is 10. And x equals 2, the height is 10. Right? So our function could look maybe like this. Right? But this is OK, because even though 
<laughs> it wouldn't pass the horizontal line test, right? It does pass the vertical line test, at least as far as we know. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay. So let's go back to this. This is about reading function values from the graph. Okay, in this case, we see four here. I know that's the input, okay? So this is the input. That means it's gonna be on the horizontal axis. So I go to the place where I see four on the horizontal axis and I go up until I touch the function, right? And I can see that this is the point four comma f of four, right? Because that's the way graphs work. We plug in the, the x value into the function to find out what is the height. Okay, and here I can see that that value, that height is two. Okay, so the way I would do it here is I'd say f of four is equal to two. And if I wanted to find the value that produces a height of zero, then I look for zero on the y-axis. So here's zero right here, and I go over until I find a point in the domain, okay, which gives zero as the output. Okay, so in this situation, it's two here, right? F of two is equal to zero, because when we plug two into the function, we get height zero. Any questions about that? All right, so let's go ahead and split into groups now. So I'd like everybody to get back into our pods of four. So, you know, people in the, like the front four people, let's have you guys in a group of three, group of four, group of four in the back left, and so on and so forth. Just move your desk into a way where you can collaborate with one another. And I'd like you all to collaborate on problem number six, okay? So we have a few things here where we want to find out whether or not they're functions. Yeah, try to join a group without, I mean, Dara, you can join a group if you want, but, okay. or you can walk around and observe what's happening. So yeah, let's try to work on six collaboratively. We just want to decide together whether or not we think each of these is a function or not a function, okay? So speak amongst yourselves and come to a consensus in the next, oh, I don't know, three or four minutes, okay?
Okay, does any group need a little more time to come to their consensus? Everyone's happy? Okay. What do we think about part A, the number of donuts that Joe the baker can make if he has N dollars? Function or not function? Which groups say function? Raise your hand. Anyone say not function? Okay. What was the argument for, for not function, may I ask? Well, I said if they put like a certain amount of money into it, that doesn't mean they can make another donut. Like, if it's like, you use $10 to make 10 donuts, then you get $10.25. Mm -hmm. You can't make 11 donuts. You can only make 10. Okay, so it's a, it's a question about whether or not we can have enough money to make the next donut. Is that your idea? Yeah. I think that's an excellent point that we should definitely consider, but I think in the end, we should think about whether the money, amount of money that we have is the input or the output of our function, right? So in this case, let's set it up with function notation. Do we think that the number of donuts is a function of the amount of dollars we have, or do we think that the amount of dollars we have is a function of the number of donuts we make? Yeah, the first one, right? Because we're talking about how much money Joe the baker has. So he's the one doing the baker, so presumably his money is spent on the supplies. So in this case, n is equal to, or sorry, d is equal to f of n, right? And I think the, the idea that was proposed was that maybe this is not a function because we could have the same number of donuts being made depending on Say we can make five donuts, whether we have $10 or whether we have $10.25. But if you think about this in terms of our table, right? If we think about this in terms of our table, this is kind of the same scenario that um, I was just talking about with the other student. What's your name again? Jack. Jack. This is what I was just talking about with Jack, where we have two different inputs which go to the same output. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our, that our graph can't be a function. Is that clear there? Okay. So that's, I think, a situation we can avoid. So let's see, how can we make this a little more concrete? Well, if we think about the number of do donuts that Joe the baker can make if he has N dollars, Let's ask ourselves, is it possible for the reverse to happen? We have $10, and on one day we can make five donuts, and on another day we can make six donuts. What do we think about this? Reasonable or not reasonable? Reasonable because it's an output. Reasonable because it's an output. Well, we have two different outputs coming from the same input. If I have $10 on Monday, and I can use that $10 to buy five donuts worth of supplies. On Tuesday, I have $10 again. How many donuts can I make? 
five again, right? So we should expect the, I mean, as long as the prices of items aren't changing, we should expect to get the same number of donuts if we have the same amount of money from day to day. Okay, so that would be an argument that I would make for saying that yes, this is a function, okay? In fact, you could probably draw a graph of it if you wanted. If you have zero dollars, you can make zero donuts, right? And then the more dollars you have, the more donuts you can make. And maybe after a certain point, you start getting like a bulk discount. So you can actually make more donuts per dollar. So maybe it even increases in slope, right? It looks like that. That could be maybe a situation of what this graph could look like. Right? Well, actually, it's not going to look exactly like this. It'll look something more like, probably more like uh, this, right? Because of what Mike was saying earlier about if you have, you know, $10 versus $10.25, it might not be enough for you to make the next donut, but it's not enough to cause this to not be a function because it would fail the horizontal line test, not the vertical line test. All right, what do we think about A, happy? All right, how about B, y equals z squared? Who thinks function? Okay, I think we got consensus there. Function, right? It's a parabola. Passes our vertical line test. And C, ooh, C is a tricky one. Does anyone want to offer up their, their group's consensus on C? Yeah? It's a function because the one nominal is undefined, so it's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is a this is a good point where I think we should bring into question what is the domain of this function? Okay? We say the domain of this function is real numbers, but x is not equal to what? One, right? As long as this is true, as long as we think about this function over this domain, okay, then we don't need to worry about having one input go to another output. Because you just take your one input, you plug it in for x, right? And you get a definite number. So say I plug in the number 2, I get 2 over one, right? For each input that I plug in, I'm only going to get one output. Okay, so this one I would say yes, it is a function on its domain. Okay, so if you said not a function because x should not be equal to one, then you are partially correct. I would say you'd be correct if they said this function with the domain r, is it a function? And you could say no, because it's not defined for x equals 1. I think that would be a reasonable take. Um, but if you say, well, this function has this domain, and on its domain it is a function, then you'd be right. So I think that one could have gone either way. So yes, no, depending on frame of reference. <coughs> All right, and the last one, hands up for yes. Hands up for no. OK, no, because right, we got the threes. Two threes that are going to the different outputs, right? So if we drew a graph of this thing at 3, we'd have one point at 3 and one point at 4, right? And it would definitely fail our vertical line test. OK, so no. Parentheses VLT. Repeated inputs going to different outputs. All right, fantastic. I think we aced that problem. Any questions on problem number six? Yeah? How did I figure out the all real numbers part of C? So that was for determining, whoa, determining what is the domain of a function. So we discussed that a little bit earlier. Let me return to that section. It was this purple remark on the side. Sometimes the domain of a function is given. Otherwise, the domain is all real numbers such that the function is defined. So in that case, since they didn't specify what the domain was, I sort of filled in the gaps and interpreted 
that the domain should be all of the real numbers such that I can plug them into the function. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, to further expand on that, the only things that we really need to worry about, okay, are dividing by zero and taking square roots of negative numbers. So if we take a look at our function, there's not any square roots in it. So I don't need to worry about doing the square root of a negative number. The only thing I need to worry about not doing is dividing by zero, right? So you need to ask yourself, well, if I have a function like this, is there a number that I could plug in that would cause this function to do a division by zero, right? So this is what I would ask myself. I would look at this thing and I would say, OK, for domain, there's two things. No square roots of negative numbers, no dividing by zero. There's no square roots. I'm good there. And oh, crap, there is a denominator. Uh, so I should make sure that 1 minus x is not 0, which 1 minus x is not 0. You rearrange it, you get x is not equal to 1. Does that give more context? Yeah, but how is it also no? Because that makes it sound like yes. How? How is it also no? Oh, I mean, OK. What I mean is that if you take this to be your domain, then the answer is yes, it's a function. <coughs> if you take domain is r, then it's no because the function is flawed. I mean, the question is flawed. So I would not really think too hard about this second part. I would say if you take the function on its correct domain, it is a function. Yeah, I understand that's a bit of a confusing example. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put something like that on an, on an exam. There's too much room for interpretation. OK, any other questions on number six? OK, let's move on then. OK, some of these problems I put at home on. I think it'd be a good uh, practice for you to do some of these at home if you want. Um, <coughs> You know, especially if you're preparing for the exam or something like that, but I'm not going to spend class time on them. Okay, what I want to talk about next are intercepts. Okay, a function uh, f of x has a horizontal intercept at Let's see, if it's a horizontal intercept, it should be uh, x comma 0. If f of x equals 0. And a function, why don't I do this one in blue? A function has a vertical intercept at uh, 0 comma f of 0, uh, provided that this is defined, provided that what? Provided that f of 0 is defined. OK, so what do they look like? Uh, if I did a graph, which I'll do in green, I will illustrate. Horizontal intercepts are where our function intercepts the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis is the one that goes left and right. OK, so in this case, our horizontal intercepts are at this point and this point. OK, it's where the height of the function is 0. And my vertical intercept is going to be when the x value is 0 or when the input is 0. OK, that means that I'm on the vertical axis. OK, so as long as the function has a value when we plug in 0, so as long as 0 is in the domain of our function, 
then zero comma f of zero is gonna be our vertical intercept. Okay, right here. Any questions about the intercept? Okay, so how do we find them? Well, we use these two equations. We use y equals f of 0 to find, well, it may not be y or x. could be h and t or w and z or whatever, right? But we set, put 0 as the input in order to find the vertical intercept, and we put 0 as the output in order to find the uh, horizontal intercept. Okay, these are the ways we find them. Any questions about that? All right, if not, let's do this problem as a group. We're going to work on problem number eight. Okay, so Kayla just finished college and fines. She has $66,000 of debt in student loans. This is way too close to home. Uh, she's determined to pay it off and figure she can pay this much per month. We have an equation D equals F of T. <coughs> And that's the amount of debt that Kayla has left. Okay, and we want to interpret some things, and we want to come up with a formula, and then we want to find the horizontal and vertical intercepts. Okay, so horizontal and vertical intercepts. So let's take about five, five to ten minutes to work on this on our own with our groups and see if we can come up with a consensus on these four problems. All right, have at it. interpret here. What we mean is write down in words what this mathematical statement means in terms of amount of time and debt. Yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Ye
So like sixty six thousand minus eleven hundred nine. Yeah. And then I put like M in dollars. If you have any questions as you go along, just raise your hand, okay, and I'll come over and help you out. Or if you need a hint. Yeah. So the way we want to set it up is we can do some D on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side we should have some expression of the number and T. Okay, so and the right hand side, if we plug in T, we can tell the amount of T. But one good place to start would be to say, how much energy do you have when T is equal to T? And then think about, well, how can we make an additional term Then you get an expression which uh, explains what D is and what T is. Uh, Right, so if you how Okay, so the way we find it is you solve the equation that x equals to zero. So we want to know what is the horizontal intercept. So we use these two equations, okay, except in our case we replace x by x and y by
Okay, let's come back as a group and talk through this. Okay, so, oh, one sec. All right, so for the first part, I think most people were able to make it through this part. We just want to think about, in terms of our function d equals f of t here, we need to think about what d and t are. d is amount of debt left, right? And t here is months after she began to pay it off. So if we think of f of 12 equals 52,800, who can tell me how we can interpret this in terms of Kayla's debt? Yeah? After 12 months of payments, she'll have 52,800 of her loan left to pay off. Exactly. After 12 months, uh, the balance is $52,800. Very good. All right, and the funny thing is for B, they ask us what is the meaning of f of 25, but they ask us before they really ask us about the formula for f of t. So I don't think we necessarily need to solve anything. We just need to describe this in general terms. So what do we get if we plug 25 into the function? Not as a number, but as a, who can describe this quantity for me? Yeah, Mike? Exactly. Amount of debt left after 25 months. Okay, great. And how about a formula for f of t? This was the tricky part, maybe. What do we think? Anybody got one? Yeah, this group over here. Yeah. Exactly. I really like this way of writing it too because it captures the, the idea of what's going on here. We have our amount of debt, right? In our equation, we know when we plug in zero, we got the full amount left, right? We have the full 66,000 left because that zero would just kill that whole second term. And then for each month that passes, we pay $1,100. So the balance goes down by 1,100. So that's why we write a minus sign there. OK? Did everyone agree with this? Anybody get a different formula? Something similar, maybe? OK. So that's for that one. And the last part. Well, to find our horizontal and our vertical intercepts, right? we want to use those equations that we were talking about up here. OK? The horizontal intercepts are these points here, right? And we know that these points which are on the horizontal axis, they all have something in common, which is that these points have the form something, some number, comma, zero, right? Some number, comma, zero. So the, the output should be zero if we're talking about a horizontal intercept. So I have a function. It has an input and it has an output. So to find the horizontal intercept, I'm just going to set the output equal to 0. So we do 0 equals 66,000 minus 1,100t. OK, we move 1,100t over to the other side. And this tells us that t is going to be, I don't know, 60? 60 times 1,100 gives you 66,000. OK? And the vertical intercept, we're going to do the opposite. Set the input equal 0. So then we get d is equal to 66,000 minus 1,100 times 0. So the interpretation for the horizontal intercept is there will be 0 money left in the account or in the debt after 60 months. So after 60 months. Kayla is debt-free, living the dream. 
Okay, and then the other one says at the start she owes uh, 66k. Yes. Um, will the inputs always be on the x-axis and the outputs on the y? Uh, okay, there's one time when they won't be. But 99% of the time, the answer is yes. Unless we're talking about supply and demand, where they do something really weird there. And it's just a vestige of some stupid financial math that happened back in like the 30s or something like that. So I'll say 99% of the time, yes, the input is almost always on the horizontal axis. Okay, because the height of the function is always the output of the function when we plug in those x values, those horizontal intercept, or those horizontal values. Good question. It will be useful if you just say yes. I'll just say yes, okay. And I'll, I'll explain the caveat later on in this class. <coughs> Any other questions on this one? Okay, well, let me move on and talk about one more thing before we're done for the day. So this is a business calculus course, so I should definitely talk about stocks at some point. Okay, and this is a great way to introduce the topics of increasing functions, decreasing functions, and constant functions. Now, who owns stock? Anybody own stock? Oh, that's fewer people than I thought. Okay, well, if you own stock, what you like to see is a graph which looks like this one in this picture, right? You like to see it going up, right? Because when we talk about a stock, the input of our stock function is time, right? Or years or whatever. And then the output is the price. So if the price is going up and you already own it, you're happy, right? So let's talk about increasing, decreasing, and constant functions. And what we need to talk about specifically is that these are local properties. What I mean by that is we might have some regions where the function is decreasing and we might have some other regions where the function is increasing, okay? So I wouldn't take a look at this function and say it's increasing. I would say it's increasing for a little while, then decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing, and then it's increasing. You see what I mean? So when I have a property like increasing, decreasing, I should describe where it is increasing or decreasing, which is why we use this way of defining them. We say f of x is increasing on the interval a comma b if x1 we take two numbers which are between a and b and not equal to one another. So if a is less than x1, is less than x2, is less than b. So our situation looks like, looks like here's a, here's x1, here's x2, and here's b. Then what should be true? The height of the function at, f of, at x2 should be higher than it was before. So f of x1 one should be less than, so then, f of x1 should be less than f of x2. f of x is decreasing under the same circumstances if uh, f of x1 is strictly larger than f of x2 and constant if f of x1 is equal to f of x2. And this should be true for any x1 and x2 which I pick which satisfy that a is less than x1 is less than x2 is less than b. So I could choose them far apart or right next to one another or one right at b and one kind of close. They can be anywhere in this interval. Okay. 
All right, so that's what I mean by local properties is it's local in the sense that it might be increasing only from A to B. Well, those could be numbers. So what would you call it if it was looks like the opposite of a local property? Global property. So there are functions which are globally increasing, like for example, the function f of x equals x. What does it look like? It looks like a line going up forever. This function is, quote, globally increasing. Or you could say it's increasing on the interval of all real numbers or something like that. Okay, it's increasing everywhere. Another way to say it. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a couple examples here and determine whether these functions are increasing or decreasing. So this is not too hard. We just need to look and make sure that as our input increases, so too does the function. Okay? So this function, we start at negative 2 comma negative 8. Okay? So that's like down here. And then we're at 0 comma 0. And then we're at 8 comma 2. And then we're at 64 comma 4. Okay? So our function looks something like this, maybe. So that's a function which each time we move to the right, the function value goes up. The function value goes up, and then the function value goes up. So what do we think? Increasing. Increasing. Pretty easy one. There's only one tricky one in here. Okay, this one, okay, we go up, 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 and then the function goes from negative 25 to negative 20. Was that an increase or a decrease? Increase. And then negative 20 to negative 15, that was a also an increase, right? And then negative 15 to negative 10, it's an increase. So this is a function which is increasing. All right, and then finally, we've got one here. I can see we go from five to 10, 10 to 15, and uh, 15 to 20. So increasing? No, why not? Why is this not increasing? The numbers are going up. Because the numbers on the top are going down. This means that as we move from right to left, the function is, quote, increasing, right? If we start all the way on the left at 1, and then we go to 2, the function value goes from 20 to 15. So the problem here is I drew my arrows in the wrong direction. We go from 1 to 2. That went down. 15 to 10, that's down. 10 to 5, that's down. This is a decreasing function. Okay, so don't get uh, tripped up when they switch up the order of all of the inputs. All right? Okay, I think I should not introduce anything further today. So. We'll close for today. There's going to be a quiz on Tuesday. The problems will come from section 1.1. It'll be in the last 10 or 15 minutes of class. Uh, so make sure you come or send me an email if you're not going to come. Everybody have a great weekend. And I have office hours today at 3 p.m. Yeah. No, okay. And it's Wiley Plus? Yeah, it's Wiley Plus. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Here? So, Daria, do we have anything left to discuss? Uh, I think I've got uh, this form. Mm -hmm. It's like about uh, expectations and like mm -hmm. what you want me to do and what don't want me to do <laughs> in terms of. So we Thank can you. do it next time. Yeah, I guess once you have it, we'll we'll fill it out together okay. and. Uh,
but yeah, generally I just would like if you do your SI sessions, just keep track of if you notice that the students are really struggling with something, if you get to let me know. Um, or, you know, if you hear them say something like, oh, Tom goes so fast in lecture, you know, make a mental note of that. Let me know that somebody said that and I'll slow down. That sort of thing. Okay. Also, are you okay with me making like announcements on Blackboard? And oh yeah, no problem. Yeah. Right, good. Also, I was thinking to create like a group meet for the class. Yeah, you can do that too. Okay. Yeah, you don't need to include me. All right. Uh, also, you're the graduate student, right? Yeah. Do you know Victoria and Andre? I do. You Victoria do? and Andre? Yeah, they're my good friends. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from Russia and they're from Russia too. We even went back together this break. Oh, okay, that's super fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to convince Victoria to give a talk at our seminar, but I haven't been able to get her to do it yet. At the seminar? You mean for this class? No, not Seniors? for this class. For, for the ACM students. Um, graduate students in applied math. We have like a meeting every couple of weeks where we have graduate students come and give talks over their research and stuff. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, good to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. All right, Jack, you got a question for me? I do. Um, I cannot meet today, but I'd like to meet tomorrow. Okay. I just like haven't taken a math class in two years. In a while, okay. Just because like how my high school worked, like mm -hmm. I pretty much got all my credits early as I could. Sure. So I'm definitely rusty to 